All right, welcome back. So today we're going to continue talking about hashing. We're gonna pretty much pick up where we left off on Friday. We'll finish talking about hash functions and what we can do with them. And then we'll introduce one of the second most useful data structures in computer science. So we've already talked about lists in this class. We've implemented a couple of different types of lists and talked about the trade-offs involved. We're giving you some practice on the MP and also on the homework on working with Java's built-in list type. Today we'll introduce the second useful data structure that really, together, armed with these two data structures, there's very few problems you can't solve. The second data structure is called a map. We're gonna give you some practice working with maps this week on the homework, today's homework problem, tomorrow's homework problem. I think there's a question on maps on this week's quiz. So we'll talk a little bit about maps. We'll finish up talking about some of the cool connections between hash functions and other things that are going on in the world, including blockchain, but also sort of deep uh, fundamental problems in computer science. And then at the very end of class, we'll talk a little bit about our second, or midterm two, our third midterm, which starts on Saturday. All right, so last time, our conversation centered around what we could do with this type of magical function. So I told you that there was a function with these properties. It turns out that this is true, which is good. Um, that has the following properties. So it's deterministic. It can convert an arbitrary amount of input data into a fixed size result. And given the same input, it always produces the same output. So that's the first thing we want. The second thing is uniformity. So over many different inputs, the results are uniformly distributed across the space of possible outputs. So if I output an int, Sometimes I'm gonna get really big ints, sometimes I'm gonna get really small ints, sometimes I'm gonna get positive values, negative values, but over time, every output is equally likely. We'll see today when we start using the result of a hash function as part of a data structure why this is so critical. And then the last thing that we needed, and today actually we're going to later in class relax this requirement a little bit, um, but typical hash functions, or the ones we're talking about so far, we also wanna be efficient to compute. And again, we'll see why in a minute. We want this to be something that we can compute quickly, even over an arbitrary amount of data. Okay. And the functions that satisfy this property are known in a broad category as hash functions. And we refer to the output as a hash code. That's the function that you call on a Java object to get a hash for that object. Um, sometimes we just call them hashes, or the hash of an object, or the hash of a value or a file, or a string, or whatever. Um, you'll also see them called digests sometimes, particularly um, in cryptographic applications, which we'll talk a little bit about later. So last time we got to the point where we started talking about that, you know, eventually, and this depends on the size of the hash output, but eventually it's possible that I'm gonna find two different inputs with the same output. And again, this depends a lot on how large the output range of the hash function is. If that range is big enough, I can make this probability incredibly small. Like I said last time, there are applications, both in cryptography and even things like Git, that really rely on this never, ever, ever, ever happening. But if I use a small hash function, or a hash function that produces a relatively small output, then this can happen, and sometimes it's even fairly common. And this can be okay. It really depends on the application. So, you know, if the size of the output is small, then I expect collisions and I have to do something about that. And again, we're gonna see this later when we implement our own hash table in a few minutes. But in certain applications, I should be able to design a hash function that's large enough, again, assuming the outputs are uniform, to make the probability of collisions incredibly, incredibly small. But we're about where we wound up last time was I introduced you to this birthday paradox, and this may come as a little bit of a surprise that we're suddenly talking about this. We were just talking about hash functions. But bear with me for a second. So, so again, in a, in a room with 100 students, what is the probability that two will share the same birthday? There are 356 days in the year, so, you know, if you're like me and you're not super savvy about probability, you might say, well, it's like 100 divided by 356, so it's about a third. Um, 
it turns out to be like almost certain. Almost 100%. So I could take like a single section of Follinger Auditorium, and if I went through here, which would be a great way to kill some time, but not something I'm gonna do in class, uh, and asked everybody what their birthday was, eventually I would find two students in this section that have the same birthday. So this is something that's known as the birthday paradox. You know how many students you need, how many people you need before you have a 50% chance that two of them will share the same birthday? It's on the slide. 23. It's kind of incredible. So why are we talking about this, right? The reason we're talking about this is, again, you can think of your birthday as sort of a hash function on people. That hash function takes an arbitrary number of inputs, like, you know, the billions of people that live in the world, and produces a fixed size output, a number between zero and 365 or 366, representing the day of the year that you were born. And a collision occurs when two people have the same birthday. So it turns out that as soon as I have 23 inputs to this kind of silly hash function that operates on people, I have a 50% chance of a collision. As soon as I have 100 inputs, I have a 100% chance, essentially, of a collision. So this is bad for our hash functions. The birthday paradox, surprising as it is, means that collisions on the hash output are more likely than we might think. So again, you know, I can, if I, um, but, but let's go through this. So this depends on the size of the output. So with my birthday hash function, I only have 365 possible outputs. As I make that output space bigger and bigger, the probability of a collision goes down. So let's see about this. Um, depends, again, depends on how large my hash output is. For 16 bits, let's say my hash output outputs 16 bits, so it goes from zero to two to the 16th, then I need 300 files before I find two that have the same hash with more than a 50% probability. Just for comparison, this is last year's MP6, not this year's MP6, because this year's MP6 had zero files in it, because it's the final project. Last semester's MP6 had 80 files in it. So clearly, for something like Git, a 16-bit hash is not anywhere close to being sufficient. What if I use 32 bits? Okay, well, now I'm getting larger, so now I need 77,000 files before I f find two with the same hash with greater than a 50% probability. I'm, you know, my, but your computer, my computer, has almost three million files on it. You might be thinking, wow, he's created a lot of files. That's not true. Most of those files are created by the system itself. Your computer probably has a similar number. The number I've created is probably much, much smaller. But typical com computers contain a lot, a lot of different files. So a 32-bit hash, if I want to uniquely fingerprint documents, is clearly not big enough. Well, let's try larger ones. What about 64 bits? Okay. Well, again, now I'm getting there. Now I need 5 billion files before there's a greater than 50% probability that two have the same hash. All right, so now, now things are starting to get better. So I've used 128 bits. I have this massive number. Um, so Git internally, right now, although I think I've read that they're planning on moving to a different hash function at a certain point, but currently Git uses a 160-bit hash function. Remember, we're going to look at an application in a minute where it's okay to have collisions. But for Git, a collision would be catastrophic. Git's entire design is predicated on the fact that hashing two files will never produce the same result. If it did, the whole system would melt down. All right, so again, if I, and this, this gives you some explanation for why those hashes you see are so big, right? When you look at, you know, your Git repository on GitHub, uh, you see these long hexadecimal strings. That's a 160-bit hash value that Git uses to uniquely identify all the files in your repository and detect when anything has changed. All right. So for Git, I need a fairly large hash function. But it turns out that hashes are useful even if I don't have a very large hash function. And they're useful partly because I can use them to support one of the most useful data structures in computer science. So 
So let's go back all the way to the beginning of the semester. I introduced you to an array. That was really the first data structure that we talked about this semester. An array puts items in order. It takes data, pieces of information, whether they're objects or integers or characters, and it puts them in order. It structures them. And when we talked about that, we pointed out that what an array is actually doing is it's associating an index with every value. So data structures typically add data to existing data in order to structure it. So what an array did is it is, arrays are essentially acting as a map between an index and some value. That value can be anything. You can create an array in Java of any kind of Java object you want. But we've had this limitation when we've used arrays that arrays will only map an integer to a value. So again, you could think of an array as mapping an integer to a value. It allows you to look up elements in the array by their index. But that index has to be an integer. So let's relax, but let's relax that restriction. So now we're going to introduce a new data structure. And again, this is one of, probably one of the most useful data structures in computer science, something known as a map. It's a generalization of an array in the sense that it still maps one value to another value, but I can map any Java object to any other Java object. I can map a string, in this case, to an integer. I can map integers to integers. I can map one object to another. Maps support operations that in many ways, despite the fact that they're functions, rather than using array index notation, are very similar to the type of operations that we support on arrays. I can set a, a map based on a key. When I do this with an array, that key has to be an integer, but when I do it with a map, it can be anything. So here is an example. Um, there's a couple of things that we want to look at here that are, that are newish to us, although we've seen them with lists before. So in Java, when I want to use a map safely, I'm going to use Java generics to tell the compiler what I'm going to do with the map. So here on line four, you see that on the left side of line four, I'm declaring that string values is of type map. Map is actually an interface in Java. So this is very similar to a list. So what I have on the left side is an interface type, and on the right side, I have an implementation of that interface. But what I'm telling Java on line four is that I'm going to use this map to map strings to integers. I can put any types into that uh, parameterization of the map interface. I can map from objects to integers. I can map from integers to integers. I can map from strings to strings. It doesn't matter. But I'm telling the compiler what I'm going to do so that the compiler can help me check my operations to make sure that they're safe. I'll show you what happens when I don't do this in a minute. Once I have a map, I have two different operations. Oh, sorry. So on the right side of line four, remember when I created a list, list is an interface. I have different implementations of that interface. One was a linked list. One was an array list. Same thing with a map. A map is an interface. Hash map is one of the classes in Java that implements the map interface. And as its name suggests, it does this by using the hash code provided by every Java object. And we will show you how this is done in a few slides, because we're going to actually implement a simple map ourselves. Once I have a map, what can I do with it? Well, I can put things into it. That's similar to setting the index of an array. But again, my indices now can be anything. I told the compiler that I was going to use this to map strings to integers, and so when I use put, the first value is the key, the second value is the value. My keys all have to be integers, my values have to be, sorry, my keys have to be strings, my values have to be integers. So on line five, I'm putting the value test into the map, I'm putting the key test into the map with value five. On line seven, I'm replacing the value for the key test with seven. I can actually also get things out of the map, as you would expect. When I call get, I pass a key. When I used an array, this had to be an index. Now, sorry, when I used an array, this had to be an integer. Now it can be anything. So I'm telling the map, get me the value for key test, which is a string. 
Same thing here. So that's going to print five the first time. It's going to print seven the second time. Again, this is a tremendously useful data structure, and it's so useful that every single language has them. And in many cases, what you'll see to kind of drive home the comparison with arrays is that a lot of other languages reuse the array syntax for a map. So look at what Python does. This looks like array index syntax in Java, right? I've got a variable, dict, and then I've got square brackets. In Java, what comes inside those square brackets has to be an integer. But in Python, this is a built-in type, and I can put anything in there, any Python object. Here I'm using a string. JavaScript calls them anonymous objects, similar syntax. In fact, identical syntax. C++ even has them, so that must mean, like, 30 years have gone by. Um, Go calls them maps. Again, the syntax here is very similar in a lot of languages. Even Perl. Has anyone heard of Perl? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. We, we, Perl's one of those languages that we are in the process of burying, um, because, whew, it was pretty awful. Um, anyway, so here's an example of Perl. Perl actually, this was one of the things that was useful about Perl at the time it came out, right, was that it actually had, I'm gonna get hate mail from all these, like, 50 and 60 year old programmers on the internet now because I said bad things about Perl. Um, here was Perl syntax for doing this. Perl had this weird curly brace syntax that it used. So sometimes the, the names we use for this uh, vary. A lot of languages call these dictionaries or dicks. Um, some languages in JavaScript, these are essentially anonymous objects, which I won't get into. Um, but, but every single programming language supports this idea because it's really, really useful. So here is the Java doc for the map interface. Remember, just like a list, this is an interface. So it, it, it dictates what you can do with any Java object that supports this interface, and there are multiple different implementations of it. Um, you can see right here, all known implementing classes, I have a hash map. I also have something called a weak hash map. I have a tree map. So these give you some hints, particularly like a hash map and a tree map, of how the map is actually implemented internally. What can I do with the map? Uh, there's lots of documentation here. The, the main things that I'm interested in here are get. I pass an object as a key, and I get out a value. So that's how I retrieve information from my map. I also have put. So put is how I set a value in the map. The other really useful operation I will point out, and of course you guys are welcome to peruse this documentation as you work on the homework problems, is this function right here, which is called git or default. So what this does is if the key is in the map, it returns the value. Otherwise, you can pass a default value that gets returned if the key is not in the map. Because, of course, sort of like an array, I can call get on a key that I haven't inserted into the map yet. If I do that with the bare get, it returns null. If I do with get or default, it allows me to return a default value. You'll see why that's useful in a minute. All right, so let's play around with these a little bit. What I have right here is a bare map. So I'm not using Java generics yet to tell the compiler what I want to do with this map. And this allows me to do things like, let's put a new value into the map and then we'll print it, just to make sure it works. So once I put in something with value test, I should get something out. Let's call, let's change this and see what happens. Okay, now I get null. Uh, let's try that get or default thing that I did a minute ago, which is kind of useful. So now if the key's not in the map, I get whatever value I pass as the default. Like lists, the problem with bare maps is that the compiler is not helping me use them safely. So you may want this map to only map strings to integers. But right now, I can put anything I want in. So I can have a second thing here where I put an integer in and map it to a string. And now let's pull that guy out. I need to be able to spell, there we go. Yeah, so now I've got a map that 
will allow me to insert any Java object and map it to any other Java object, but I'm not getting the type safety that I might want. The compiler isn't able to help me and say, wait, you wanted to use this map to map strings to integers, but on line eight, you're putting an integer in and mapping it to a string. So how do I do this? I add my type parameter here. I say this map is going to map from strings to integers. Over here on the right side, I need to use, this is called the diamond operator in Java. Essentially, this will just copy over the type parameters from the left side of my statement to the right side. So this will give me a hash map that maps from strings to integers. Now when I try to run this, the compiler is gonna tell me that on line eight, I'm doing something with the map that I told it I wasn't going to do. I told it I was gonna use this map to map from strings to integers. Now I'm trying to put an integer in as a key. I can't do that. So this is always the way you wanna use maps to make sure that you don't, uh, you don't have, you don't use them unsafely. Questions about this before we go on? We're gonna talk a little bit more about Java generics this week in terms of how to build classes that use them. Yeah. Yeah, so the diamond operator here is the, so the question is what is this doing? It's equivalent to this. That makes sense? In, in, in older versions of Java, you actually had to write all this out, but then somebody, I guess, had stared at enough of these and they were like, wait, this is, this is dumb, right? I've got the same thing on the left and the same thing on the right. The compiler can help me figure this out. And so rather than typing the same two type parameters, I can just use this. But I think this came out in like Java 9. Small improvement. Good question. Other questions here? Okay, so let's do something with the map. Let's solve a problem. All right, so here's an example. This is kind of like the classic example using maps. I feel a little bit silly doing this one. But let's say I have a big corpus of text very similar to today's homework problem, not exactly the same. Um, and I want to essentially be able to look up how many times a particular word appeared in that text. So in the past, you could do this. You guys have been able to solve this programming problem up till now. What you would have done is you would have just saved the string and then inside my get word count, you would have had to go through the entire string array and counted the number of times that that word appeared. But what we're gonna do here, and this is an interesting trade-off, is we're gonna use a map and we're gonna pre-process the string when this word counter object is created. And then we'll be able to uh, answer questions about the string extremely quickly. So I've got my class right here, the class is called word counter, has a private map variable called word count. Uh, inside my constructor, I'm initializing that map to be a new hash map, which is one of the implementations of map. And now what I want to do is I want to go through my text word by word. In this case, text is an array of strings. And I want to either do one of two things. If the word's not in the map, I want to add it with key one. It's the first time it appeared. If the word is in the map, I want to add it with key I want to increment the key. Sorry, increment the value, right? All right, so let's, let's uh, do this. So I'm going to pull each of the words out of my string or wire one at a time. I'm going to show you two ways to do this. Um, the first one is to use something called contains. Let me make sure this is actually part of the map interface. I'm pretty sure it is. Um, contains key. Okay, there we go. Got the name wrong. So contains key word. Otherwise, I'm gonna do something else. So I'm testing to see, is this word already in the map or not? Have I already seen this word in the string array? If it's in the um, map already, then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say word count dot put for this key, my whatever the existing count was, plus one. I've seen the word again. So the word has appeared, however times many had appeared before, plus one, yeah. Yeah, I know, but we're gonna do it this way first, and then we're gonna come back and do it in a slightly more clever way. There is a cleaner way to do this, right? But this gives us a chance to look at some other operations using the map type. Otherwise, 
what I'm going to do is I'm going to say word count dot put word one. It's the first time I've seen the word. Now down here, when I am asked to retrieve how many times the word appeared, again I'm going to use my word count dot contains key method. So if the word is in my map, it means that it was in the text that I was given to process. It was in that string array. So in that case, I'm going to return word count dot get word. Otherwise, I'm going to return zero. Okay? That seems to work. So what happened here? I passed an array of strings. That array contained the word here twice, the word there once, the word nowhere zero times. I processed that into a map, and then I was able to answer the queries quite quickly. You'll notice there's a trade-off here. What I've done is I've moved all of the work that this function does into the constructor. So the constructor now is going to be slower because it's actually going to process the entire string. If I was only going to count one word in the string, it would probably be just as fast to loop through the string once and look for it when I called get word count. But if this object is going to answer lots and lots and lots of different queries about this single piece of text, then it's more efficient to do the work in the constructor, because the constructor runs once and get word count runs a lot. So that's a, that's a trade-off here. Yeah? Because I've seen the word again. Yeah. Yeah, I'm counting the number of times the word appears. So the question was, why do I need to add one? Every time I come across the word in the string, I've seen it again. If I've already seen it once, then there must be some count in my map already. All I want to do is increment. Yeah, good question. All right, so it turns out that there's a, a much cleaner way to do this, and the cleaner way is to use, there's a function, well, there's a, someone suggested using put if absent. Let's do that. Let's figure out, I need to remind myself how this works. Uh, where is it? Put if absent. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. Actually, here's here's how I'm going to do this. I'm not going to use put if absent. I'm going to use something different. Just as just as clean. So remember, I have this get or default method. So here, what I can do is I can say word count. Dot put word word. Why do I want to spell word like gourd today? I don't know. Sorry. Or default. Word zero plus one. So this will still work. Why does this work? It works because if the word is in the map, I get the count. If the word's not in the map, I've never seen it before, get or default return zero. So the first time I see it, I'll store the value one. After that time, I'll increment the value. Down here, I can do the same thing. I can say return word count dot get or default word zero. If the word's not in the map, it didn't appear in the string. Questions about this? You guys will have a chance to practice this on today's homework problem. But again, you might try solving this using an array again and remind yourself about how awkward that was. This is so elegant, it's really clean. And it's all enabled by the fact that now I can store, I can, this is sort of like an array, right? I'm essentially creating an array, but the keys in the array are the strings. Okay. So how does this actually work? So what we'll do today is we'll look a little bit at our own implementation of a map. It turns out to not be that hard to do. What we need to use in our case, and there's other ways to implement maps, but in this particular case, we're going to use this idea of hashing that we introduced on Friday and today. So, how are we going to do this? I'm going to get a hash code for the object. Then, internally, I'm going to use that hash code, or a version of it that's smaller, as an index into an array. What do I do if there's a collision? So let's say I have, internally, my map has an array of size 16. 
Remember, it's not gonna take very many values that get stored in this map before I have a collision. So what do I do if I have a collision? I have two keys that I put into my map that after I compute the hash code and, and shorten it a bit, end up in the same slot in the array. Ah, I use a linked list. It's one way to do this. And again, this beautiful synergy that we're seeing now where everything we've talked about this semester is sort of coming together. So now I've got a data structure that combines an array and a linked list. So what do I use the list for? The list is when I have a collision. So here's what happened here. At some point, I put two values into my hash map that both mapped into index zero of the array. The first time I put one in, it was here. The second time, it ends up here. When I go to get a value out, what do I do? I essentially reuse the same operation. I use the hash code to find the right, we call these buckets in our hash table. And then I go through the list that's hanging off of that bucket and I look for that object. If it's there, I find it, I return it. If it's not, I can return null or, or whatever. All right, so here is actually a little uh, snippet of an, an imp actual implementation for a hash map, and, and we will, we can uh, finish this together and we'll actually see that it works. So, so let's, let's walk through this. So the first thing I have is a constant that determines how large my internal array is. So I'm calling, calling this table size partly because frequently this, this internal array is called a hash table. It's implemented using an array. Then I have an inner class. This should remind you a lot of our linked list implementation. I have an item. It has a value, like my linked list had, but it also has a key. Remember that a map maps from a key to a value. So every item in my list has both a key and a value. But like the linked lists that we looked at, it also has a next reference. So it allows me to follow the list to the next reference. And I've got a little constructor there. All right, on line 13, I allocate internally a private array of items for this hash map. The size of the array is the table size that I said. This is not the maximum number of items that I can store in the map. This is simply the maximum number of uh, elements in the initial hash table. What we'll see in a minute is that as I add more and more items to this hash map, those lists are gonna get longer and longer. But I can still store an unlimited number of items in this map. I have an item count variable just for fun that gives us a sense that things are working. Um, okay, so I have my own little hash function here. And what is this doing? So let's look at the hash function I'm gonna use to, as part of this hash map implementation. So I'm using hash code, but then I'm also using it with the Java remainder operator for table size. So this is gonna give me a value between zero and 16 once I fix the fact that the Java modulus operator is actually not a modulus operator by adding the table size. So I'm taking this hash code that Java objects all provide. This is one of the cool things about this is that I can use this for, I can store any Java object because every Java object has to provide hash code. Hash code provides an int, assuming that int is evenly distributed over the range, even after I take the modulus 16, I'm still gonna have a number that's evenly distributed between zero and 15. So I have an equal chance of getting zero, five, three, whatever, between zero and 15. And that's my hash value. That's what I use as an index into my array. So let's walk through this put function. So this takes a key and a value. This is very similar to the map interface, the official Java map interface we were just looking at. What does it do? The first thing it does is it figures out what bucket in my array or my hash table is this supposed to be in. It does that by calling hash on the key. So int is going to be a number between zero and table size minus one. I then use that as an index into my array. My array is an array of item references. So essentially you can think of the array as containing a bunch of beginnings of linked lists. The linked list contains all of the values in the hash table whose key ended up in the same bucket. 
All right? Now I, so now I'm walking the list. This should look quite familiar to you. This is essentially list, you know, this is, a, this is a list walking loop that you guys have written before when we were working with linked lists. Now for every item in the list, I check whether or not the key equals the key that I'm looking for. If it does, then I'm replacing an element in the hash table. I'm not creating a new element. And so what I do is I update the value and return. If it doesn't, then what this means is I'm adding a new item to the hash map. This key has never been put before into the map. I create a new item, and then I add it to, and essentially what I do is I add this item to the front of the list. I increment the number of items and return. Questions about this? I know this is new, but there are no new ideas here. Now, you guys at this point have seen the fundamental basic building blocks of everything else pretty much you're gonna see throughout the next couple of years in our program. What you see now are remixes, right? Like an array combined with a list, combined with a tree, right? You see you know, more advanced data structures that are essentially combining different idioms, right? So again, I have a hash map that uses hashing, lists, and an array all together. An array with pointers to linked lists, and then a hash code that tells me where to start. Okay, so this already works. Put works. So let's run this, and you'll see that my item count after I run it once is one because it was a new item, and then after I run it again, it's still one because I haven't put a new item into the map. I've just updated the value for test. So for fun, given that we have a few minutes, let's write get. So get, unlike put, is going to return an object, and it should take a key as a parameter. In many ways, I'm gonna do a lot of the same things I did in my put method. The first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna figure out what bucket should this key be in. This gives me a value between zero and table size minus one. I start at the beginning of the list that starts in this bucket, and then I walk forward until I either walk off the list or until I find this item. So I'm walking through this list. Now inside I say if current.key.equals key. This is the object that I'm looking for. And I'm gonna return current.value. If I break, if I fall out of this loop, it means that the object wasn't in the map. So I return null. That's it. Pretty simple. It's actually a little easier than put because I'm never modifying the, the hash map. So let's see if this works. There it is. Questions about this? Let's try putting something else in. Maybe this only works if the key is test. Let's put something. Oh wow, look at that. That wasn't even planned. Questions about this example before we go on? Again, nothing new here. Arrays, linked lists, hashing. So let's talk about the performance of this. Let's bring in another component of the things we've done this semester. Algorithm analysis. And this is a fun case, because it's not that simple. But let's talk about what happens at the limits. So let's say that the array size, you know, this, this map will work if I set the table size to one. Still works. But if the table size is one, what do I have here? I have a very over-engineered over version of what? It's just a linked list, right? I've got one, I've got an array with one value that points to the start of a list. So every single thing that I put into my hash map is gonna end up in the same bucket. So essentially what I have here is just a linked list. So at that point, how long is it gonna take to put an item into the list? O N. I've gotta walk all the way through the list to make sure that that item's not already in the map. 
right? So again, go back here and look at put. What does put do? Put through walks has to walk the entire bucket that this new value could be in. So as the number of items gets really, really big, and if my array is very small, then put starts to approach on. What about get? Same thing. It has to walk through the entire bucket. So this is one of the cool things about hash maps. When the table is very small compared with the number of items, the performance starts to be pretty awful. It's like, why not just use a list at this point? I mean, adding and retrieving items from a list is a win. The reason I don't do this is because, let's think about the other extreme. Let's say that my table is large relative to the number of items. So when the table gets smaller and smaller and smaller, you can think of all the items ending up in the same bucket. So they're all essentially in one long list that's strung out starting from one or only a few values in the array. What happens if the table size starts to get really big? Then what happens? Let's go back here. Say that I set table size to be 1024. Again, still works. But what is this starting to behave like? W once I get to the right bucket, how many items do I expect to find in there? Zero or one? Because every item is now in its own bucket. Because the hash table's gotten really big, the probability of collisions is going down. Essentially, one way to think about this is that when the array is small, the probability, condition, the probability of collisions is really high. As the array gets bigger and bigger and bigger, the probability of collisions becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. And as a result, most of the buckets have either no items in them or one item. And so as soon as I find the right bucket, I'm done. And so put is a one. Get, also a one. What's the problem? Here, or what's the fundamental trade-off that I have to make? There's a problem with this limitation, yeah. Yeah, it takes a lot of space. It's acting like an array, but it requires a lot of space. And, particularly if I don't have very many items in my map, most of that space is wasted, because it's an empty array. Most of the values in the array don't have most of the slots in the array don't have anything that's hashed into them, and so they're empty, and so they're just space sitting there, right? So this is the fundamental trade-off with, with this hash map implementation, which is really interesting. When I make the array smaller, the space efficiency improves, but the performance degrades. When I make it bigger, the space efficiency degrades, the performance improves. This is not the first time that you will experience this kind of trade-off in computer science. This is extremely common. So usually what you do, what a real, like if you use the actual Java hash map implementation, what it'll do is it will adapt. So when it starts off, it chooses a default value for that internal array that's small. But then once the map starts to fill up, it will enlarge that array and then rehash items into new buckets. That's not a free process, so it's expensive, somewhat, to kind of change the size of the array to accommodate more items. Um, the, the point at which this is done is something called, is based on something called the load factor. It has to do with how many uh, items are in the map compared to the size of that array. So this is stuff you guys will see again downstream, and like I said, at this point, having seen lists, having seen arrays, having seen trees, you guys have pretty much seen the core data structures of computer science. What you're gonna see downstream are Variation, right? Remixes, tweaks, trees that have more than one child, right? You know, lists that might not only have a pointer to the next item, but a pointer to the item that's like 50 items downstream, right? Just various different permutations and modifications to the core data structures that you guys have already seen and understand. All right. So let me wrap up by talking a little bit about cryptographic hashes, because this stuff's actually really, really cool. So at this point, we've been relying on these functions, these properties of the hash map, of the hash function, right? 
One thing I want to point out, actually, let me pause, go back here for a second. We'll look at our implementation again. Remember we talked about uniformity being important for a hash function. If I have a bad hash function here and it returns zero every time, for example, then all of my items are gonna end up in the same bucket. So this is one place where uniformity is extremely important. If my hash function's not uniform, then items don't get distributed between the different buckets in my hash table. If it is uniform, then over time, even as the number of items in the hash map grows, the, so the length of those lists is gonna be roughly the same. So this is one place where that uniformity assumption becomes very important. But now we're gonna relax this assumption about efficiency. Actually, now we're gonna look for functions that are hard to compute. We're also gonna require a new set of properties, right? So here's one of them. If I give you the hash, it is infeasible to compute the input that produced that value. So if I give you the hash value, the hash code, you cannot produce the value that I used. To, to create that, and we'll see why this is so important in a minute. A small change to my input should produce an enormous change to the output. So if I have a file that I'm hashing and I make a tiny little change to it, like I change one character, the hash value should be totally different, okay? Some of the ways of hashing that we've talked about in the past didn't have this property. So for example, if I sum up all the elements in an array, a small change to one of the elements produces a small change to the hash value. That's not sufficient for this new set of hash functions. And the final thing I want is this function actually has to be somewhat difficult to compute, not easy. We'll see why in a second. So this is something, a family of hash functions that are called cryptographic hash functions. It's partly because they saw some of their first early uses in cryptographic applications and are essentially ubiquitous in those applications today. They're used all over the place. Let me tell you about one of the common applications of this. So, you guys have passwords that you use to log into websites. You might have wondered, does that website store my password? If they do, then you're in trouble if somebody hacks into that website because your password is now out there in the open. If they don't, how on earth is this done? How do they check your password? So this might seem like a riddle. I wanna be able to check your password, but I don't wanna save your password. How do I do the check? How does this work? What's done is that the website doesn't save your password. It saves the hash, a cryptographic hash of your password. And how this is done is slightly more complicated, but this is bas the basics of it. I save a cryptographic hash of your password. Then when you go to log in, what I do is I rehash your password using the same hash function and I compare the two results. If the two results are the same, you provided the right password. If they're not, you didn't provide the right password. The critical part here is that if someone hacks into my site and steals my entire database, they don't recover your password they recover the hash of your password. And remember, these nice features that my cryptographic hash functions have. Given the hash, it is infeasible to determine the original input. There's no way to take the hash and invert it to get your password. It's also slow to compute the hash function. So you might think, well, I could just take all possible passwords and hash them one by one by one by one and wait till I found the right output. This takes forever. It's infeasible because the hash function is slow. The other thing too is that, remember this result right here, a small change to the input produces a large change to the output. So if I find a value that hashes to a result that's close to the hash of your password, it doesn't mean that my input is close to the hash of your password. So the hash function doesn't leak any information about the value. There you go, I just said this, right? So here's an example of the, this MD5 function we used last time is actually a cryptographic hash function. It's not a very good one. Please don't use it for anything important. But you can see here, for, the, for example, here's my original sentence. I produced the hash. It's this big hex value. I made a tiny change. I just capitalized this last letter. The hash value is totally different. It bears no relationship to the original value. All right, just to wrap up today, I have zero minutes. 
So blockchain, which you may or may not have heard of, is actually secured using this exact process. So very, very quickly, how does this work? I'm going to show you the proof of work. So essentially, and maybe we'll come back to this on Wednesday because this is cool, in order to um, prove that I've done to contribute to the blockchain, I give you a challenge. The challenge is find an input that hashes to a particular value. And actually, the way that Bitcoin does it is hashes to less than a value. Because of the properties of the cryptographic hash functions, that allows me to prove that you've actually done a lot of work in order to find that result, because you've had to try lots and lots of different random inputs. It also means that, and this is critical for blockchain, making a change to this distributed le ledger takes an enormous amount of work and computation, more than any adversary would have. All right, we'll pick up here on Wednesday and finish up a few of these things. Good luck on the quiz that starts tomorrow. I will see you all 